Greetings and welcome to a Word for Today Bible teaching, which is brought to you by My Cornerstone Church right in Bryson City, North Carolina. Well, if you've been with us, you know that we're working our way through the book of John. We're doing verse by verse and chapter by chapter. So let me encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bibles, get a pencil and a piece of paper. As the scripture teaches, we do want to be Bereans of the word. Oftentimes I hear from people say, you know, I wrote something down. I didn't quite understand maybe what you said. And, and I wrote it down and I was able to go back later and review it. Well, my friend, let me encourage you. That's exactly what we want to do. So today we're going to pick it up in John chapter 18. And we're going to pick it right up in verse 28. So John 18:28. And the name of today's message is, Don't Be a Pilot. So John 18, 28, it says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Well, Jesus was led from Caiaphas' house, which Caiaphas was the high priest at that time. And it says that Jesus was led from Caiaphas' house into the Praetorium. Now, the Praetorium is just another name for the Roman governor's residence. Now, Pilate, which was Pilate, and Pilate's normal headquarters was in Caesarea, which was the capital of the Roman providence of Judea, which was on the sea coast, and it had a beautiful beach, very much like Florida, you could say. However, during the Jewish festivals, uh, the Holy Festivals, Pilate, he would leave from Caesarea and he'd come to Jerusalem with the uh, Roman military troops. And the reason they would come would be to discourage any kind of disturbances that might be taking place. Now, keep in mind, during the Passover, it was an eight day feast. During that eight days, there'd be up to like 2.5 million people right there at the Passover in Jerusalem. So now this was the reason that Pilate was in Jerusalem at that time. And the scripture there in John 28, uh, in verse 28, it says that it was early in the morning. It was believed to be around 5 a.m. or so. And the trial with Caiaphas had ended. Now Jesus was bound again and he was led away from Caiaphas right on over to uh, Pilate's residence. Now, what's interesting was Caiaphas and the spiritual leaders were the ones who made up the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the, like our Supreme Court would be today. They had already judged Jesus. They found him guilty of blasphemy and they decided that Jesus must die. Now, since they didn't have the power to execute him, talking about the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, they did not have the power to execute him because capital punishment was a, really a Roman prerogative at that time. And so they deliberated, the Sanhedrin, they decided to take Jesus to someone who did have this type of authority and power, which was Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. So now we see it's about six or seven in the morning. And Jesus was led through the streets to Pilate's quarters. Now from Caiaphas' house uh, over to where uh, Pilate was staying was just about a quarter of a mile. Now can you imagine that quarter of a mile there was a crowd that was following them that was leading Jesus over there. Now the crowd who was following was the Sanhedrin and, and others who had been notified about this was getting ready to take place. Also along with that was probably his mother, his disciple John, and probably, more than likely, Peter was with him. So it says that then they left there and now they're on their way. And whenever they arrived at the governor's palace, the Jews did not enter because it's a Gentile courtyard. Now if the Jews would have entered it, they would have been considered polluted or ceremonial unclean, and then they would not have been allowed to celebrate in the Passover. Now the Jews, they believed that since the Gentiles did not take any type of precaution, uh, what they would do then is they would hesitate to go anywhere that a Gentile was, especially during the holiday times such as this. Because they would have thought, hey, if we participate or if we get associated with the Jews, that's going to make us unclean to participate in the Passover. Now picture this. Here's the religious leaders. They get over to the praetorium, to the governor's residence. And they stand outside because they can't go inside because it may defile them. 
So here we're going to see the scene that we're getting ready to go through today. The scene here is set for a series of confrontations with the religious people on the outside, the judgment hall, you could say, and the political authority and Jesus on the inside, which was the governor's palace. Now, interestingly, the Jewish leaders, think about this, my friend, they were worried about becoming ceremonial, unclean or defiled. But yet at the same time, it didn't bother them that they were plotting the death of the true Passover lamb. So now let's look at John chapter 18 and let's get in verse 29. Pilate then went out to them and he said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and they said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him, you judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Well, we see here, now think about this. The Jews, they use stoning in cases of capital punishment. Whereas crucifixion was the Roman gov uh, governor, it was their way of executing somebody. And it would be done by crucifixion. But here, the Jews' refusal to carry out the death penalty, the Jews unknowingly fulfilled the prophecy. Now, what prophecy uh, did they fulfill? Well, if you look over in John chapter 3, verse 14, let's flip right over there. John chapter 3, verse 14. I'll get over there in just a minute. Sorry about that. It says here, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if you want some more prophecy to see the fulfillment of it, you can look in John 3.14, John chapter 8, verse 28, John chapter 12, 32, and verse 34. Now, let's go ahead and get right into John 18 and verse 33. It said, Jesus answered him, Are you seeking... Or I'm sorry, uh, verse 32. Let me go back there. Then Pilate, verse 31. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and you judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, Is it not lawful for us to put anyone to death? That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death that he would die. There again, we're talking about that prophecy being fulfilled. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, and he called Jesus, and he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Well, we see right through here. Now Pilate, he took Jesus into the praetorium, and he brought him in there for a private interview. And Pilate asked Jesus, he says, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, Jesus answered, think about this. Jesus, in essence, was really saying, Is this something that you truly want to know, Pilate? Is this something that you desire to know about, if I'm the king of the Jews? Or is this just what you've heard from the, from the Jews outside? Now, it appears here, my friend, that Jesus was the one that was doing the questioning, and he questioned Pilate over this. But look at verse 35 there. It says, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have fight." so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, And Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You are rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth, and everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So we see right through here, Pilate's answer really was also an admission that he knew of no real charges that were being brought against Jesus. Then the Lord confessed to him that he was a king, but not the kind of king that the Jews had accused him of. Now also, in this situation here, Jesus was letting Pilate know that he was not the kind that would threaten Rome. 
Jesus was saying that his kingdom is not advanced by human weapons. Otherwise, his disciples, they would have fought to present him for being captured by the Jews. And then Jesus went on to say that his kingdom is not from here. That is not of this world. My friend, that would have been carnal if Jesus would have put it that way. And then in verse 37, Pilate really didn't understand these distinctions between Jesus' kingdom and his own. And Jesus went on to say that his kingdom is concerned with truth, not with swords, not with shields. Now, the truth here that Jesus is talking about is about the truth of God, about the truth of who he is, Jesus Christ himself. My friends, also along with the doctrine, it also talks about the truth of the Holy Spirit, the truth of man, the truth about salvation and all other doctrines of Christianity. And then Jesus went on to say that everyone who loves the truth hears his voice. And that is how his empire grows. And his empire grows by the truth and not by weapons such as the way the Romans were building up their kingdom. But look at verse 38. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He's asking a question there. And then they all cried again. That's talking about all the Jewish people. Now, when I talk about Jewish people here, I'm not talking about your everyday Jewish person. I'm talking about the Jewish religious leaders, such as the people of the Sanhedrin. So don't mistake what I'm saying here. But look at there again in verse 40. They all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Now, whenever we think about this, when Pilate had asked Jesus, What is truth? Was he puzzled? Or do you believe that he was sarcastic? Or do you believe that he was even interested in the truth? Now, obviously, by the way that Pilate handles these matters, he was not one who sought the truth. Pilate then went outside to the Jews and he said he could find no fault with this man, Jesus. He couldn't find anything that Jesus had done wrong. Although at the Passover, it's customary among the Jews to request a release of some Jewish prisoner from the Romans. Now, Pilate agreed to release a prisoner. Now, the reason he did this, my friends, it was an effort to please the Jews. But at the same time, I believe that it was, a, it was an effort to release Jesus at the same time. But the scheme, the scheme that Pilate had come up with that failed. And the reason why I say it failed is because they wanted Barabbas, who was a, a robber that was released. Uh, some people said that he was trying to lead a revolt against the Roman Empire. And he killed somebody. So we know that he is a robber and possibly a murderer at that time. Now, by the way, my friends, that name Barabbas. Bar means son and Abba means father. So Barabbas, his name meant the son of a father. Now, Pilate, think about this. Pilate trying to display a lack of interest for the truth, he still had failed to do the right thing. He was trying to draw attention to himself as being generous and offering them the custom of their day. But here, my friends, Pilate made a horrible mistake. As a matter of fact, over in Matthew's Gospel, it says that Pilate's wife warned him to have nothing more to do with Jesus. Here's why, my friend, because Jesus, he was a righteous man. That's in Matthew 27, 19. So now let's go ahead and jump into John chapter 19 and let's pick it up in verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and he scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Here we're seeing that Pilate was really trying to release Jesus, I believe. But he had incorrectly hoped that if he would have Jesus flogged, 
that it would satisfy the Jews. He didn't really want to kill Jesus because he stated a couple times earlier that he could find no fault with Jesus. But he was thinking that, hey, if I just have Jesus flogged, beaten, you could say, then all the Jews and they would be satisfied with just a good beating. Now, it appears that Jesus was not scourged in order to be crucified, but he was scourged to, or in order to escape the crucifixion. Now, my friends, back in those days, there were three forms of flogging that the Romans had administered to the people. The lightest of these was a light beating, and those were usually the, the beating that the hooligans received. The second beating, or the second flogging, it was just more severe. That was for criminals who did a more serious crime. But then listen to this, my friend, the third. The third type of flogging was the most brutal. The worst criminals, including those sentenced to uh, crucifixion, they were the ones that would receive this type of flogging. Now, evidently here, so far, Jesus... He had received either the first or the second beating at this time. But later on, my friends, Jesus would receive the third flogging after his sentencing. Now, let's talk about this, the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns that the Roman soldiers, they wove and they placed on Jesus' head. It probably came from a date palm tree, which had about 12 inch thorns or spikes on. Could you imagine that, my friend, 12 inches? Some of the Roman coins back in that day, they pictured various emperors wearing such crowns that appeared to radiate glory from their heads. Now, here's the difference, my friend. However, the palms... The palm fronds that these kings would wear, they were turned inward instead of outward. Oh my, I'm sorry, my friend. Those prongs, I said it backwards there. The prongs, when the kings wore them, faced outward. So they didn't have a chance to get the prongs buried in their head. But yet, whenever it came time for Jesus, they took then they took those prongs and they flipped it over and they turned the prongs on the inside. So that when they went to put the crown of thorns over Jesus' head, those thorns, those 12 inch spikes, they were buried down inside of Jesus' scalp. Oh, my friend, what a horrible, horrible way that Jesus had suffered for you and I. So they put the crown of thorns on him. Then it says that they put like a, a reddish purple robe on him. Now, this was probably one of the troopers' coats, one of the guards' coats. Then they placed it over Jesus' shoulders. But my friends, they did this. They used it in mockery. And the reason I say that, because in that day, purple was the color of royalty. So you could see, my friends, they put the crown of thorns over his head. They put this purple robe over his shoulders. He had been beaten. Now, think about this. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious leaders... Now, they would have probably been happy to see Jesus ridiculed and beaten. But the Jews who followed Jesus, they would have felt outraged and hurt by the treatment that Jesus was receiving from these Roman soldiers. Now, let's look at John chapter 19 and let's look at verse 4. Pilate then went out again and he said to them, Behold! I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. In verse 5, Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Behold the man. Now Jesus received the abuse that John had described inside the praetorium, which was in private, uh, Pilate's headquarters. Now we see that, that Pilate, he had brought Jesus out so the Jews could see their king in his humiliation. But first, he announced to the Jewish people there, he said, I have found Jesus not guilty, but I found him innocent. Then in verse 5, he said, Behold the man. Perhaps Pilate was appealing to the people's compassion so that he could release Jesus. Or possibly Pilate's reply reflected the disgust 
that he had with the Jewish leaders. My friends, I I believe that's the third time that Pilate said he could find no fault in Jesus. Now, what's interesting was here's these Jewish religious leaders. They had brought Jesus to Pilate because they didn't have the authority to put him to death. Only the Roman government could do that. So they brought Jesus to Pilate. Now, here's the thing. They brought Jesus to him for a decision. Pilate had given the decision, and now they refuse to accept it. Look at verse 6. John 19, verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. Here again, my friends. Pilate said, For I find no fault in him. And the Jews answered him there in verse 7, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Well, we see that the chief priest here, Pilate, he had made a decision. But the Jews looked at Pilate as if he was wavering. So they cried out fiercely, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! And as we see, it was the religious men who were the leaders in our Savior's death. And Pilate seemed to be really disgusted with them. And why? Because of their unreasonable hatred that they had towards Jesus. And Pilate was basically saying to the Jewish people there, Hey, if that's the way you feel, why don't you take him? And why don't you crucify him? And Pilate knew that the Jews couldn't put him to death because that power could only be exercised by him at that time. Now, when the Jews saw that they had failed to prove that Jesus was a threat to Caesar's government, they brought forth a religious charge against Jesus. They said that Jesus had claimed to be equally with God by saying that he was the Son of God. Now, to the Romans, they were Gentiles. They didn't care anything about God. But to the Jews, this was blasphemy. And blasphemy was a custom in that day that was punished by death. Now look at John chapter 19. Let's pick it up in verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying... He was of more afraid. And he went out again into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I had the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been been delivered to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, the possibility of Jesus being the Son of God, <laughs> when he heard it coming from the Jews' this charge, now think about this. He was already uncomfortable with this whole entire situation that was taking place because three times he said, I could find no fault with him. He's already been trying to give Jesus back to the Jewish religious leaders for them to crucify him. But now whenever he heard this, that Jesus claimed to be the son of God, (laughs) this made Pilate even more afraid. It says that Pilate then returned to the praetorium, to his residence, or to the judgment hall. And he was questioned, and he questioned Jesus even more. And Pilate even tried to force the Lord to answer to him by threatening him. He says, don't you know, Jesus? Can't you talk to me? He was saying, Jesus, don't you know that I had the power to, to release you? But at the same time, I also had the power to crucify you. Oh, my friends, Jesus was remarkable. He answered quietly that whatever Pilate had, it had been given to him by God. In other words, there was a higher authority than Pilate himself. Now we're going to see here in verses 12 through 16, Pilate's getting ready to give in to the pressure of the Jewish people. John chapter 19, verse 12. It says, From then on, 
Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Now when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and he sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in Hebrews, it's called Gabbatha. Verse 14, Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Then the chief priest answered, and They said, We have no king but Caesar. Verse 16, Then he delivered him to them, talking about Jesus, to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and they led him away. Well, my friends, just as Pilate, as we see through this section, just as Pilate became determined to release Jesus, the Jews, they used their last and the most telling argument. He said, they said to Pilate there, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Now, Caesar was the official title of the Roman emperor. My friends, he had much more authority than what Pilate had here. And by this remark, Pilate couldn't afford to have the Jews accuse, uh, accuse him of disloyalty to Caesar. So what did he do? Well, we see right through here that he weakly submitted to the mob. It says that Pilate then brought Jesus out to an area called the pavement. Hebrew is called Gabbatha. Now, this is the area where such matters were often handled. In verse 14, it talks about the sixth hour. That's probably about 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, that's according to Roman time. You see, my friend, there's different times with Roman time and then with the Jewish time. So it says it's probably about 6 in the morning, according to Romans time. And then, behold your king, Pilate said. He said this to annoy and to provoke the Jews. He was starting to blame them. Listen to this, my friends. Pilate, he found nothing wrong with Jesus. Now Pilate, he's starting to blame the Jews for trapping him into condemning Jesus. Pilate there in verse 15, he says, Should I crucify your king? And then the Jews, listen to this, my friends. They were stooping very, very low here by saying, We have no king but Caesar. Now, what's interesting is that these Jews, the multitude that was there with them. They began by wanting a political Messiah to, to deliver them from Caesar's oppression. But now we are see they're rejecting Jesus. Now they have Caesar. <laughs> Verse 16, Then Pilate was willing to please the Jews, so he turned Jesus over to the soldiers to be crucified. My friends, he did this because he loved the praise of men over the praise of God. Now I want you and I, here's a takeaway from this section today that I believe that you and I need to grab a hold of. Think about what Jesus went through before his crucifixion. In John 18, 22, he was slapped in the face by Ananias, or Annas, I'm sorry. And then Jesus was spat on. He was beaten before Caiaphas and the council over in Matthew 26, 67. And then it says that Pilate scourged him and the soldiers smote him with the crowns of thorns and the purple robe and then they slapped Jesus. And before they led him to Calvary, the soldiers mocked him and they beat him with a rod. That's in Mark 15, 19. Think about, my friend, how much Jesus suffered for you and I. Now, from a human viewpoint, the trial of Jesus was the greatest crime, the greatest tragedy in all history. But from the divine viewpoint, it was a fulfillment of prophecy and it was the accomplishment of the will of God. The fact that God had planned all of this, it didn't absolve the participants of their responsibility. As a matter of fact, over in Pentecost, over in Acts chapter 2, let me turn right over there. In Acts chapter 2, verse 
we're going to see here that Peter's going to sum all this up in one statement. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 22. And I'll get right over there in just a second. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by the miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose, which is what we're talking about here, Jesus was delivered to the Romans for a purpose. But also it says by the foreknowledge of God. He says, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosened the pain of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Well, here we see, my friends, that this all fulfilled the prophecy of how Jesus would experience death. He would be raised up. First of all, he would have been uh, traded. He would have been betrayed by the Jewish people, the leaders, and then he would be found guilty and be lifted up on a cross. Now, my friends, I believe that just by you being tuned in here today, it is the will of God that you have heard the truth of the scriptures. And I just want to say to you, my friend, please do not be like Pilate and not accept the truth. Do not be like Pilate and not accept the truth. Well, my friends, this, going, this is going to close the Bible teaching for today, a word for today. And if you have any questions or comments or you would like to help support this ministry, you may do so. You may call me, Pastor Bill, at area code 828 488-0445. Again, that's 828-0445. Or you may go on our website where you may listen to all of the teachings here in the book of John that we've been through. You can get to our website by going to www.mycornerstonebc.com. Again, that's www.mycornerstonebc.com. Dot com. Well, my friends, until we meet again and we open God's word and a word for today Bible teaching, I just want to leave you with this. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. Amen.